Hello, everybody. We're live. Welcome to this thing now. It's 2024. We're uh, going to try new things. This is Hans, Hans Nelson. Uh, for those that follow the channel uh, closely, you know that Hans is uh, part of our community. And he's also one of the most uh, brilliant people I've ever met. And he has his own channel as well on YouTube and on X. Uh, he talks about uh, he talks about a lot of this got a lot of similar stuff that we talk about on this channel but uh he's uh he's doing his own thing and i figured starting in 2024 that you know we tried doing a weekly conversation together uh it seems like friday 2 p.m might be a good time we'll see how that shakes out for the for the upcoming weeks but we're gonna we're gonna discuss different topics we'll use this platform as a way to sort of brain dump at the end of the week so that we at least for me I don't go into the weekend with anxiety, thinking about, oh, I didn't talk about this thing. <laughs> I need to get this out of my brain. And Hans, I, I, I thought was probably the best person to do that with because I trust, I trust him very much, and he's, uh, he's a fantastic, uh, very smart dude. So, uh, yeah, hi, Hans, how are you? <laughs> How's it going? I don't think you should lie to people on your stream. I'm definitely not the smartest person that you've ever met. Not even close. Oh, come but on. <laughs> I do enjoy having lots of deep dive conversations, and I am excited about this. And uh, yeah, it'll be fun to kind of explore a little bit more general format and not necessarily be stuck on the Tesla and Elon related space. I know that will definitely be, be a big part of you know what we talk about. But um, you know, there's a lot of other stuff going on in the world that's really important. Yeah. And um, yeah, so a lot to talk about. So today's topic, I mean, we'll start with X. So it was funny. <laughs> we don't always want to be talking about Elon and Tesla. Let's talk about X instead. <laughs> yep. But uh, it's, I think it'll be a good a, a sort of a good place for us to start this because, there, you know, th there are shifts that are going on in public discourse. And it's it's fascinating how that one individual seems to be driving that again. Uh, with sort of a disruption, let's say, of a of a of a uh, of an industry that I think has needed disrupting for a long time, and one of the topics that I've been thinking about quite a bit is sort of the the recent uh, changes that have been happening to the pl platform as far as who's coming on board. So now you know when the the uh, platform was purchased X in this case back in 20, uh, 2021, 2022, uh, he put no 2022. Yeah. He put in the bid and he, he purchased it in October. Um, there was a lot of skepticism about the success of the platform and how it would transform over time. You know, how was a distraction to, uh, Elon Musk's current ventures with SpaceX and Tesla. And now as we're getting into it more as of late, I'm, I'm at least I'm sensing a shift in how the platform is being perceived. And I'm seeing a lot of new voices pop up that are that perhaps were on the sideline before that are becoming a lot more uh, enthusiastic about what's going on. And I think one of the recent things that has happened on that platform is the addition of, you know, agree or disagree with these folks, the addition of people like Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon, who's somebody on the opposite side of the political spectrum that's going to be doing a show on there as well. You got Tulsi Gabbard doing a show. You have a lot of people that are uh, have said for the longest time they would leave the platform, but they're as engaged as, engaged as they've ever been, <laughs> mainly because it's a place for people to fight ideas so I'll, I'll tee it off there and maybe uh i'll hand it over to you hans and kind of maybe brain dump what what that sort of thing brings up in your mind and then we can turn into a discussion yeah i think that obviously if elon wants this to be a public town square or specifically you know really a global public town square um but since the united states is one of the countries with the most free regulations and laws on the books as far as free speech then you know the culture of free speech is going to be kind of centered here in the united states um and i think that the that means that a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are going to end up being a little bit u.s centric from the political side of things just for that um that fact alone one of the things that as he purchased it you know we saw a lot of people from the left say they were leaving or actually leave um, and that was really not a positive sign for having a good, healthy, actual town square where debates could happen, discussion could happen, people could really talk about things and have a nice wide open Overton window um, that was well balanced. And a lot of people noted that at the time, and they were definitely right to note that we were 
moving much more in the direction of going towards the right. And, you know, a lot more people on the right side were earlier in embracing doing things like starting shows and, you know, like Tucker Carlson and Don Lemon both left their networks at roughly the same time. And it's taken Don Lemon much longer to come to X than it took Tucker. He embraced it right away. And, you know, some of that is definitely going to be colored by the fact that Elon was putting forth a lot more rhetoric that was a little bit more popular on the right side of the spectrum than the left side of the spectrum at the time. But I think that the Don Lemon move actually is a really positive sign that, you know, maybe we were way over here on the, you know, the left side of the spectrum and we were moving towards the right. And maybe we even overcorrected to the right a little bit now. But now that we've got people like Don Lemon and Tulsi Gabbard, who, you know, she was a, a Democrat who now is an independent, um, but they are, they're joining of the platform and really utilizing it, I think maybe swings us back towards the center a little bit, which I think is a really positive overall sign. I think that we really need this to be something that is well balanced from the left side and the right side to be a productive conversation. Um, because I think both sides really have a lot of valuable perspectives and not just left and right, but also, you know, there are other dimensions that we should talk about besides just uh, conservative versus progressive. And, you know, there's the authoritarian versus libertarian axis, which I think is even more important, honestly, than the uh, conservative versus progressive. Um, but, you know, on both of these axes, we need actual balance and we need people with strong points of view kind of at every point in the spectrum, but, you know, including the the far ends of the spectrum to have a voice and be able to say what they need to say, but we don't need the overall conversation to be controlled by those people that are really far on the fringes in, in any direction. And, you know, that would include libertarian versus um, authoritarian as well. But obviously, you know, when you're looking at authoritarian versus libertarian, just on a principles basis, the libertarians are never going to be the ones to silence other people's speech as much as the authoritarians will. And that's, you know, one of the, struggles that we really have found ourselves in, I think, over the past decade is that as these platforms have become very, very powerful, they have drawn a lot of attention from people who didn't like the fact that their power was being challenged. And they really did try to exert a lot of control over all of the social media platforms and, and just the open internet kind of in general. And so we are moving. And I and I think that's the the overall positive trend that, you know, while we kind of ping pong back and forth on the progressive conservative um, spectrum here in the on X specifically, then we are definitely moving, though, from authoritarian to libertarian. And that is an incredibly positive thing that I think should be embraced by both people on the right and on the left who want to continue to live in a pluralistic society where each individual has the ability to be respected for their voice um, to be valued and for their freedoms to actually be something that is important. So, yeah, I think that's, a, you know, really where I'm at kind of overall in just watching where we are um, socially and then watching the evolution of X as a platform. Yeah, I I, uh, I agree with all the points you just brought up. What, what's very interesting to me, if, if I go back sort of to, the, to the Don Lemon thing, is I was actually, I was slightly surprised that it actually happened because that was my hope at the very beginning uh, was when they both left the networks. I was like, just throw up those two a bunch of money, <laughs> bring them here and showcase why having a uh, have, having both sides debate each other is, is so important such a thirst that that the public has that I don't think we've really um, we've really satiated in, in any in any meaningful way. I think what's really interesting about him coming on board is I do believe Don Lemon in this case, I do believe I do hope, let's just say I hope that this actually uh, will um, push other people on on the let's say on the left side of the political spectrum to take the platform a, a lot more seriously when it comes to open debate because of some of the uh, perceived quote unquote wrongdoings that were done when the platform was initially purchased where maybe folks felt like oh my god this is like it's too far right it's clear that you know we're going the wrong direction whatever you may think but in reality if you go on the on the platform at least from my experience 
as of late, especially in the last two months, I've never seen better, uh, better conversations and more open discussion of ideas than I've ever seen on that platform. And this is, has been back since 2008. I've been on Twitter X for four, for the better part of how many years is that? 16 years or whatever it's been. And I just find it very interesting that now we're this this Overton window that we talked about. For those that are not familiar, the Overton window, a simple way of thinking about it is basically what is allowed to be talked about in any given society, even though it say it's not it's not illegal to talk about it. The acceptance of what's being talked about uh, can change. So if you have a very small Overton window, that basically means there's like very rigid rules, quote unquote, on what you can talk about or can't talk about. And now since this uh, purchase of X, this Overton window has been just blown wide open and you're seeing all kinds of discussions happening. I think that that, that in itself, the, the thirst for varied quote unquote controversial discussions, whatever you want to call it, there's a giant thirst for that, a giant thirst for that from the public. And it almost makes a, it almost makes a brilliant uh, business case for platforms to, to really take that on and take it seriously because the amount of attention that I see that getting on the platform blows anything else out of the water. And I'll use my, my recent example of uploading the, the Elon Musk space with Andrew Tate and Alex Jones and, you know, Vivek and this <laughs> freaking it's surreal space that happened, which a lot of people on the replies thought it was AI. And I'm telling you, it's not AI. It was 100% real. And I can't believe it is, but it is. I when I uploaded that supercut on 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 here on this channel, I fully expected two things to happen. One, I expected for YouTube to give me a strike for posting what they deem to be uh con like stuff you can't say, <laughs> disinformation, misinformation, you know, uh, controversial opinions, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I I just you know, Alex Jones and Andrew Tate in, in the same spaces like that should break something, right? So that didn't happen. And the opposite happened. This thing went viral on my channel, which I fully didn't expect. And the second thing I expected to happen was that I was going to get demonetized. That they would say, this is, goes against our, our rules in some way. Advertisers are very pissed off. We're going to demonetize this video or we might demonetize you as well because you know, you've gotten a strike for this thing. So the opposite of those two things happened. This thing flew and it was not demonetized. If anything, it, it was one of my, my, my better performing videos when it came from that perspective. And so that, what, that opened my eyes to a lot of things. I, as somebody who's sort of, you know, you and I are both quote, quote unquote in the, in the media space and we, we see the trends. We post a video, we see how it performs. We tweak a title and a thumbnail, we see how that changes things. Um, we see what advertisers like to pay more for and what advertisers like to pay less for. Like we, all, all that stuff's in the data. And the fact that something like that performed that well on YouTube, which YouTube is a phenomenal platform, but in the past has not had nearly as as open and free, let's say, rule sets when it comes to these types of conversations. The fact that they embraced it fully and this thing took off is telling me that the 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 Overton window the Overton window has been shattered. Like it's 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 way bigger now, and the acceptance of what's acceptable is much more broad. And I, I don't see how, I, I, I find it hard to believe that this wasn't due to X being run in a different way. Like, I, I don't know what else would have caused that, you know? It could be that maybe we're in, we're in, a, we're in an election year and advertisers are sort of smart and they're like, okay, and, and platforms are smart and they're like, okay, let's let this run because it's obviously gonna perform well. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think this is a direct, it's a direct response to what is happening on X. The fact that the formula of just letting just letting humans human doesn't matter how controversial it is, uh, just ab abide to free speech, uphold those values, and let the chips fall <laughs> where they may, and pr make it profitable. You know, make it so that you don't punish people for speaking within the legal framework of a country. And just you know, reward them with a, a monetary incentive to uh, say things that are that a lot of people will find to say resonate with them or whatever. Like uh, actually incentivize discords in a sense. Making that profitable is giant. It is is a giant lever that hasn't been pulled before. We've done the opposite, and I think we've had this artificial suppression of this 
insane business case where freedom of speech is actually very profitable. And I think that's how this this is changing the game. I just word vomit it. So I'll shut up and let you let you go from that. Yeah, that really got me thinking on a couple of different layers. So I think that, you know, it's easy to assume that the platforms themselves are the ones that want to censor, that it's YouTube, that it's Facebook, that it's Google, um, you know, or I guess I should say meta that these are the things that would like to actively censor speech. And I think to a certain extent, there is some truth to that. Hold on just a second. No problem. Um, I think there is some truth to that, but I think it's probably overestimated. And this is complete and utter speculation on my part. Um, but I think that the pressure on those platforms to do a lot of that censoring really was coming from government agencies and various powerful cohorts that um, we've seen exposed in the Twitter files. And the thing is, once that whole thing gets brought into the light and they lose their ability to actually close the Overton window, like, uh, you know, I would love to have some insight into whether or not they are still actively doing the exact same things with Meta and with, you know, all the other social media platforms and Google. I guess it could be, you know, both open internet and social platforms. Um, are they still doing those exact same things that they were doing with Twitter when it was Twitter? Or since they are no longer able to control the totality of speech, is there any point? Like, is it basically a, a binary thing that's either on or it's off? Um, I mean, I'm sure it's not completely binary, but I think it wouldn't surprise me if it's mostly binary and that the that pressure has probably evaporated to like 80% or something. And so that would actually make it much easier because, you know, I don't think that YouTube actually really wants to censor because... I agree. If they can make more money from ad revenue by having, you know, I think one of the one of the things that I'm going to watch is YouTube and Twitter as as X rolls out monetization, I expect to see a number of prominent firearms channels come onto the X platform because those used to be some of the very biggest channels on YouTube. And then YouTube got all kinds of pressure and flack. They completely changed their monetization rules. And all of those people basically got demonetized. They had to completely change their business model and do a whole bunch of stuff. And there's a whole category of creators who are kind of in that vein um, that had similar things happen at a similar time. And once we see those creators come to X and start making a bunch of money, then the question is, okay, how do the other platforms re respond? Do they open back up or do they just stick with their overall censorship regime again? Um, and so the reason that I bring that up is because I think that that is an easy uh, case study that we can watch fruit. to kind of s get insight into how things are working on the deeper levels that it's harder to see. I think I think that's a great point. The the like the firearm channel example is is perfect because i can see how a lot of people would agree with the sort of notion that says well if if, if i'm from the sort of political uh side of the of the of the ball game that says hey I, like guns should not be legal because they are extremely dangerous and then you you know you think of like youtube's policy to say not monetize those channels because youtube's sort of uh worldview aligns with yours like somebody who who is for that would be like thank you youtube for doing that but i think the i think i believe the correct approach my opinion the correct approach in this day and age is just is it legal or not so last last time i checked <laughs> owning firearms in the united states is legal and so i don't know why a corporation would find it needed to punish those types of channels, especially when you have a world where now you have a competitor in X that will not punish those channels because they're abiding uh, to the to just the law. They're saying this is the law, like it or not, that's the law. And I'm really sorry about your feelings, but that's just the law. 
That's that's how it works. And I think having that force now with with X, which is it's just this is very disrupting. It, it's it's disrupting by nature, right? It, and it's very much aligned with what if you're familiar with Musk companies, what Tesla and SpaceX have done to their to their relative industries. SpaceX disrupted rocketry with reusable rockets. Tesla disrupted auto with electric and self-driving cars, right? And now like uh, uh, X is disrupting these other things by just saying the law is the law. We're not going to punish anybody from a monetary perspective unless you are spreading falsehoods, which is what the community note system is supposed to do. It's supposed to like on a post by post basis. If the masses agree that this is done in deceit, then there's a mechanism that says, hey, we're not going to reward you for spreading the deceit. But if all you're doing is just posting about, hey, I like my AR, like my AR is sick, check out what I can do. Okay, why should we punish that person for that, right? It's legal, you can own an AR and, and do it. So I think that's very interesting. And X is like that counterforce. It's a counterforce to other media companies that says, if you're not abiding to the rule, to the law, and you're not doing it the way we're doing it, which is maximally allowing people to uh, figure out what they want to talk about as long as it's within the bounds of the law. If you don't do that, you're going to be at a natural disadvantage because we're going to hoard everybody. <laughs> I think most people are comfortable with that. I think most people are comfortable, it's my opinion. I think most people are comfortable with the notion of allowing other people to do whatever they want as long as it's legal. And if YouTube monetizes firearm channels, it's fine. Like, I don't see that. that's why that's a bad thing. And so if YouTube doesn't do that, they're at a disadvantage by default. Um, there is a comment you want me to bring up. Did you want to hit something before I do that? Oh, you're muted. Come on, bro. Yeah, let's you go ahead pro. and bring that up. No, I'm definitely not. <laughs> so regardless of your politics, it's never good to assume you're right about everything. This is from Peter. Thank you for your comment, my friend. Uh, what uh, What's the thought here? Yeah, I think this is extremely important for society as a whole to operate under this, you know, not everyone is always going to agree with this. Um, but the truth of the matter is that we all have very limited perspectives. And honestly, every person pretty much believes that they are right from their perspective, that almost no one really believes that they are the bad guy, or that the thing that they believe strongly is not justified in some way. And, you know, not to go down a whole relative rabbit hole, the way that all of those errors get corrected is when people who can see those errors have the ability to point them out. And then there needs to be some sort of consensus mechanism for people to say, you know what, actually, that is um, not true. And this thing over here is more correct than that thing over there. Um, and I think the sign, I th one of the concepts that I would highly recommend people look into is, you know, go read What's Our Problem by Tim Urban of Wait But Why. It's a great book. It talks about a lot of these topics. And what Peter's talking about here is basically the concept of getting to the higher rung levels of thinking where we hold on to ideas loosely and we let ideas battle each other ferociously and see which ideas win. And we as the people, we don't necessarily attach our identity to the ideas that we're experimenting with. Um, and so that's what he calls high rung thinking or high rung culture. And then low rung culture is where people really, really get attached to the ideas that they have so closely that if the idea is attacked, they themselves feel attacked and they go into this fight or, you know, fight, flight, freeze response. Um, and so if you have the ability to say, you know what, this is an idea, this is not me, and maybe it's right, maybe it's wrong, it should be able to be questioned, challenged. Um, if it's true, then it should hold up under scrutiny. And I think that's one of the things that it's really, really important in science. And even science has uh, kind of gotten almost um, not disrupted, but um, corrupted recently. And it's struggling to actually 
say things that, you know, we, there are scientific things that we know to actually be true that scientists can't say because they're not popular, which means that science itself is not functioning optimally. And um, yeah, that's, that's one example that we can see in kind of an objective realm that we need those things because if we, we start operating like, you know, the laws of gravity don't exist, well, that's not going to be good for anyone. And, you know, obviously we're not to that level yet, but that's the direction that we're heading. And we need to kind of correct that. Yeah, I think uh, along the same lines as the previous comment from Peter, this is from Patrick on X, attaching your identity to your ideas, that is the heart of the matter. I think the the, the thing that this reminds me of is, uh, I've heard Joe Rogan say this as well, is like, you are not your ideas. Like, you are not your ideas. And, and that is such a helpful way of thinking about discourse and sort of being comfortable with being challenged is that and this is something that I've, I'm, I'm forcing myself to step outside of the like I'm trying to practice this myself right I'm trying to actually uh try this and not just say it and this is like this live stream is an example <laughs> of me stepping outside of the comfort zone on on my on my YouTube and trying to like hey like let's put this to the test here is that getting stuff out there while being comfortable with being challenged is so important to ensuring that we're not going the wrong direction because we are imperfect by design. Like we we do not know what we're talking about most of the time. Like I, I'm fully, I, I, think, I think it's important for all of us to say, we are going to be wrong a lot and to welcome opposition from the opposing side is super important because at the very least, like in a worst case scenario, you change your mind to something that's more reasonable. And in the best case scenario, a scenario, scenario, you test your thesis so much that you know that it's bulletproof and you can you 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 can sleep comfortably at night knowing that this thing that's been bugging you in your head, you're finally laid to rest because you've had some some honest good people challenging you on on what you're thinking about. And I think that's very important for for a person. I think that's really important for a person, and it's it leads to that sort of like uh, culture almost of embracing freedom of speech for what it really is, which is a uh, creating a battlefield for ideas. You know, back in the day, they did it for a different reason <laughs> to try and ensure that you know freaking governments don't you know take over people. But it kind of like you know if you let it go long enough, it kind of devolves to that. You know, I think I, I think if you let it go unchecked for say a couple of generations before you know it, you're back to square one, and you know we're we're lords and pe peasants all over again because we're not allowed to say or do things that others can't you know so um interesting did you did you have any i have a comment highlighted uh that i want to bring up which is about x uh but did you want to go on that train yeah, let's, more let's go for it yeah so here's from uh from david uh Karoma f thank you for your comment my friend um i love that Streamyard can now do youtube annex comments dude it's so sick it's like we're bringing them both together. Uh, I like community notes, but to offload all quality control to users is insane. I think this is an interesting topic because it kind of like, for me, it kind of go that goes down that rabbit hole of, I would rather the masses have the power versus a small group of people that are working in the shadows, right? So it's like here, in my opinion, democratizing the ability of having people from opposite sides of, say, the uh, political spectrum or different worldviews to come together in agreement, I, even though it's imperfect and you have to offload your trust on humanity, in my opinion, that's much better than having a small team of people that I don't know how they're being influenced. <laughs> you know, those people are probably in the same chair for years on end for those people to become the quote unquote truth police. That scares me because I know for a fact that humans are corruptible, are imperfect, will make mistakes. Uh, and, you know, those small group of people could be influenced in a way that all of a sudden the truth doesn't become the truth. It becomes something else. It becomes propaganda. It becomes what you they want you to believe, right? What do you think about this comment from David. I understand the concern there and it is something that is very natural. I think that having one platform where maybe that is the extent of the quality control is 
an experiment that needs to exist. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe they do have to change this over the long term. Um, but this is definitely an A-B test for society that absolutely needs to happen. And it needs to be placed in tension with other platforms that are going to be much more top-down, command and control style, quality control. Um, and so, you know, we'll just have to kind of see how it runs. Um, but that's that's my thoughts on this. Yeah. And there's a follow-up coming from David. The mob can be corruptible too, though. Thank you for acknowledging, though. Of course, David, this is what it's all about. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you, but I think the... The chances of the masses being corrupted, I think, is less than a small number of people being corrupted. With let, let's say high morals, <laughs> because I think as long as okay, so maybe maybe the point Dave is making here is maybe the system itself can be corrupted. You know, maybe maybe the system of community notes can be corrupted in a way. What do you well, think? So one of the ways that I think about this is actually the exact reason why we have a constitutional republic instead of a democracy. And, and in that way that, yes, you know, the majority can easily and often is wrong in important ways. Um, and so that is something that has to be navigated. And that's why we have things like the Electoral College and why we have you know, the different branches of government that are set up in tension to one another um, is to try and prevent the ways that these things typically go off the rails. Now, Community Notes already has an architecture that takes that kind of stuff into account that the only things that rise to the level of being accepted as Community Notes and being shown to general users and not just the um, participants of the Community Notes program is that those notes have to be agreed upon by people who typically disagree on other things. And so you can kind of use the overall landscape and map of disagreements and find places of commonality um, to see, okay, this thing is likely to be true because these people who don't normally cooperate with one another agree that this is true. Um, right. And so that is an inbuilt mechanism to correct for this. But no system is perfect. And that is one of the things that community notes will have to continually contend with that as the landscape continues to evolve, the actual algorithm for community notes will also need to co-evolve with that landscape so that it can not um, basically fail in important ways, especially around um, important topics as you know, world events really uh, are shaped in a large way by what happens here. Yeah, and uh, here's a question from Mimi along the same topic. Who says they have to work in the shadows in respects to say an alternative for community notes? Yeah, I think I think the the sort of point that Hans just brought up is 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 kind of like why by default community notes in my head is better. It's because you are not in the shadows by default. It's a it's a open source algorithm that we know how it works. It pits two people with opposing views to come together for a agreement on if something is accurate or not. And to me, that's always going to be a lot more transparent than a small number of folks that are essentially hired by a corporation that are then trusted to do that function. And then as the years evolve, we don't know who those people, if those people still hold the same morals, if they hold the same sort of thought processes, if maybe they've influenced each other to converge into a like a like the same group think, right? Whereas if you leave it wide open and you allow just humanity to to drive that instead of a small number of folks, I think that by default, like that that will shift with 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 humanity. Like like what those disagreements and agreements will shift with humanity. Whereas if it's a small number of people by default, those people I think over time will congregate and it has a higher chance of becoming corrupted than just allowing humanity to drive community notes. If that makes any sense. Did I make any sense there Hans? I hope so. Yeah. I, I think that maybe the point that Mimi was uh, proposing was that you could have some sort of centralized system or quality control that doesn't operate in the shadows. And so she's kind of proposing something, which, I, yeah, I agree with what she said. Uh, this is just, I think, a different direction for one possibility. And it is a good question that, you know, as long as we can, the question that I have is, how do you know if it is or is not transparent? 
like there can be a transparent base to that quality control system. But that doesn't mean that you actually have see through into all of the important decisions. And I think that the the system that we've had is a great example of that, that, you know, we basically all thought that these decisions that were being made about who gets to speak and what they get to say here over the past five years were the decisions of the platforms themselves. And then come to find out later, they weren't for the most part, the decisions of the platforms themselves that because those platforms had gained such power that forces that were very resourced and had specific agendas were able to co-opt those systems. And that's the problem I think that is really dangerous about anything that is overly centralized is that if you have something that is overly centralized and has a great deal of influence that it essentially becomes a honeypot that attracts those people with the most resources and the strongest agenda, you know, the most uh, skin in the game who want to utilize that for their own ends. And and the thought there is that uh, humans, it's, it's hard to find an example in history that humans won't at some point uh, become a force that want to corrupt something for their own personal gain, <laughs> especially when they have power and influence. You talked about this quite deeply just just a moment ago too. So, um, yeah, it, it's it's very interesting. It, it's very interesting to think about what uh, what other things do you wanna do you wanna hit here? Uh, what's going through your mind? I guess I could. One of the things that I'm thinking about on this topic is we've basically had this experiment and we've played it out a number of times, and it is the experiment of monarchy versus democracy that monarchy is that thing. And monarchy works great if you have a great monarch, if you have a great king, if you have a great queen, man, there is very little that operates as well as that system when everything is perfectly aligned because you have the benefits. And this is, you know, Elon is essentially a modern manifestation of a highly functional monarchy that Elon is in near complete control of his various companies that he has veto power and decision power to make any major decision in any one of those companies that he needs to. And that doesn't mean that he is involved in all of the everyday minutia of every single company. It seems like that is becoming less and less the case over time, although it was very much the case early on in each one of those endeavors. Um, but the problem is that you know, monarchies don't last and that kings and queens and CEOs and entrepreneurs, they all get old and they die. And then somebody else takes the reins who has um, a different worldview. They have different perspectives. They have different skill sets. And oftentimes it is the process of building that kingdom that makes someone an incredible king or queen. And if you are inheriting a kingdom rather than building a kingdom, then you do not have the same perspective that a builder would have about how to make tweaks and how to make decisions. Um, and so that's why over time, monarchies definitely fail. And so that's why democracy has been a system that people have experimented with throughout the centuries and millennia is for this exact reason. And it does seem to have a longer lifespan than monarchies do, but it also is subject to the same overall forces just on longer timescales. Um, and so I think that's something to... I know Elon says, think from first principles, not from analogies. And a lot of times thinking about the way that history rhymes is thinking by analogy. But if you can use those analogies to get at the fundamental or first principles of the matter, you can transfer a lot of time some of the principles from, you know, different time periods or different historical situations to the times that we live in. So that's one of the ways that I think about that. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. I think the what, what I what I struggle with is like what what sort of what you just described where <laughs> democracy tends to be a, a much better way of handling things than having a monarchy over time. You know, I think the, and sort of how do we apply this to, 
to in this use case like X and and just democratizing democratizing like sort of people people's ability to speak up and uh, be comfortable doing that. There's still that sort of barrier that we have to go through, which is like, okay, but how do you put that in practice, right? Like, how do you actually make that a thing? You know, all of us can sit down and and be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then when push comes to shove, it like, I think it's 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 there's a lot of friction to actually you know, have everybody be on board with that, right? And I want to highlight, just as you were going on that train of thought, it sort of peaked, something came to mind that I wanted to highlight. There was a a post from Mark Cuban on X. Uh, Mark and Elon were going at it a couple of days ago. Uh, and he was, I, I forget the exact topic they were talking about, but there was, there was vigorous debate. I believe it was about DEI. Yeah, it was about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then... I mean, Mark was getting freaking, he was getting beat up, that guy. And he stood, I mean, he's too strong, you know, he's too strong and he stood for what he believed in, which is great. But then this post I thought was very interesting because I think this encapsulates how this can be successful long term. This thought process about, okay, making X into a place where people are comfortable speaking up with the trust that others will, you know, will actually, uh, that others will look out for you even when you're, quote unquote, saying something that others will not agree with. I have to say, this is from Mark Cuban. I have to say that over the last 24 hours, I found X to be warm and welcoming. The diversity of responses in both tone and content has been heartwarming. This is very important because this is why something like this is so valuable. I did have to block one account with a large number of followers. I wonder if that was Elon. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but beyond that, I appreciate all the engagement. And I think like the idea here should be, what what can X do as a platform so that everybody feels that way? You know what I'm saying? Like, it, is that even possible? Is that like, th does it require other people to to do that, like to say that? Does it require other people to speak up and say, yeah, there might be a couple corners of the Internet or a of X that are very uncomfortable and unwelcoming. And it feels like, why would I even be here? This feels insane versus like. People should, you know, the, the silent majority should be like, yeah, this place is kind of, kind of, kind of cool. I get to see stuff that challenges me, and I feel comfortable speaking up and talking about how I view the world and view ideas. Like, how do you think that's an unsolvable? Like, is that even something that we can solve for? Yeah, no, I, I think that it, I guess it depends on what you mean by everybody, um, and the so not every person who is on X is going to feel like they appreciate the fact that everyone gets to have their own viewpoint and they get to voice it. And I think that, you know, the people that are not happy with that really are going to be on either. They're the people that are really identifying with their ideas and they can't handle having ideas challenged, or they're going to be people who love to control their environment so much that they do not appreciate and it's really, you know, a very similar type of person. Um, they don't appreciate the openness that it takes to have an idea challenged or to let someone say something that is really, um, really rude. I think that's one of, you know, a completely separate dimension that it is. I love to have ideas challenged when people are challenging the ideas in good faith and they are not attacking the individuals that are involved. Um, and so I typically disengage with people. I love to engage with people who will attack ideas and not people. And I will disengage even if someone is really great at attacking ideas, but in the process, they go after the people involved. I typically will not um, participate in those conversations uh, because they make me personally very uncomfortable. But I think that anyone who um, will hold ideas kind of with an open hand and understands the fact that, you know, has the humility to appreciate the fact that no one has a monopoly on truth, or at least no person. Um, and right now, no company, no corporation, no nation, no AI system, um, you know, nothing that we have made to this point has been able to achieve that. And that is kind of the Holy grail. So, Anyone who I think embraces that can embrace the fact that people get to speak their mind on X and can enjoy because there are definitely going to be lots of places 
on X where you can enjoy that experience in a way and you can, you know, curate it for yourself to remove types of behavior or the types of engagement that you don't necessarily want to that, you know, while the overall system itself is free, that each user has a lot of agency and ability to moderate and um, really curate their own experience, their own feed, what it is that they see, what it is that they don't see. And so I think that, yeah, that's something that really is, I think it's the best system that is possible currently. And it is the one that maximizes the number of people that can enjoy that and have a positive experience doing it. And I also think that there is a, like the silent majority, I think fits the bill of reasonable, can, you know, truly understands nuance, will not be emotional at first. They will like try to like take it for what it is. They're willing to like, you know, uh, really really allow the idea to f sort of go to go to war in their head a little bit but they're not insane like i am and they they don't actually like write a post <laughs> you know they actually have a they're actually normal people who are good people and they're like i have better things to do right and i think that's that's where like i have to like ensure that that's where that's the bubble that i that i that i try to fight constantly is like i'm trying to ensure that I'm not in a bubble when I'm thinking about it this way, because I, I do believe what you just said applies to, to like, like people that are rational and are good when they're, when they're thinking and, and they're well-meaning when they're trying to fight with ideas. That's actually the majority. That's the huge majority. It's just, they're not going to do it on X. They're not going to do it on Facebook. They're not going to do it on wherever else they're, they might do it at the family table. They might do it with their friends and family. And this is kind of like, this is not real life. It's like just a place where you go and be entertained and maybe get news from time to time. And I think, I think over time though, what's interesting is there, I think there needs to be a, some sort of tool though, that's important to ensure that the systems that are in place like legacy media and corporations and things like that, that there's an important counterbalance to be able to call out things that are going too far because, because of the amount of power those, those institutions hold, if there's not some sort of force that can fight that, it becomes problematic. And that's why I, I gravitate to things like X and, and, and things of that nature, because I can see the value of it. Like I, I really enjoy seeing th things that disrupt in a way that's better for humanity, in my opinion, right? And I think some, and that that's why something like that should exist. But at the same time, if the if the reason why that exists is to ensure that people are on there speaking up, speaking up, and speaking their mind, I think all of us should ensure that we're carrying ourselves in the same way we would with somebody in real life, right? Where we're like in front of somebody and, and we're communicating with them. We're polite, we're nice, we're kind, you know, and <laughs> I should really, I need to listen to my own advice because sometimes I'll be on there freaking trolling people because I'm like, you know, they'll be saying something. I'm like, haha, whatever, you know, like I just troll. And maybe I should stop doing that because I'm not a real good role model for that. But um, no, it's, it's very interesting stuff you just, you just set there. And it's just fascinating seeing this thing ha actually happening in real time because it does seem like a positive trend, at least from, from my perspective. It seems like something that is disrupting an entire industry that, in my opinion, has needed disrupting for a long time. And it's interesting that it's the same guy that is disrupting auto and is disrupting space. And I think that's... And, and I also th sometimes think about how, how big of an effect does that have when we know that that singular person has a lot of attention on him already. And then as he's navigating into this world of legacy media and stuff and, you know, freedom of speech and whatnot, I wonder how many doors are being opened to that thing that wouldn't have been opened before if it wasn't for that person doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like if it was some random person buying Twitter, I wonder if it would have the same exact effect as uh, someone like Elon buying Twitter. So, yeah. I, I agree. I think there's, so one of the themes that we've been touching on here that I wanted to pull out is the theme of tension that usually, you know, a lot of people will think about something that's true and they'll think about it almost like there is one thing that is true and it's kind of like the tip of a mountaintop that, you know, you're kind of ascending toward. But it seems to me more like the nature of truth is um, a, there's multiple things that are true 
and that what is the most true is the thing that finds balance or not necessarily balance, but tension that you take two true things and you put them in opposition to one another and they're both true. And then that is actually the most pragmatic thing that you can do um, and the most useful thing that you can do. And so this is an idea that I think that Jocko Willink puts forward really, really well in a book called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And he talks about a number of different dichotomies that leaders have to balance, you know, giving being too involved in the decisions of their subordinates versus not being involved enough that you need to not completely control something that someone does, but you also can't let them operate in a way that's completely opposite to the goal of the overall team. And so there is that tension that you have to to navigate. Um, And so that's something that is true on a number of different levels for our own lives, but it's also true in society. And that's, you know, what X I think is doing is it is setting itself up as one of those points of truth that is putting tension on things back towards a more sane, more center, um, more functional viewpoint. And it does take someone like Elon who is completely comfortable with being controversial because he's setting up a new point of tension. And so he is pulling a lot of things towards his viewpoint now. Um, And so he has to be comfortable with not caring the fact that this is going to upset a lot of people, but then also have the ability to be able to stand up under all of the pushback that he's going to get, whether that comes from individuals or governments or corporations. Um, And so he needed to have the power and influence that comes with running some of the most disruptive and um, culturally uh, effective companies in the world in order to do that. Absolutely. Did you want to hit uh, another topic before we do some uh, Q&A? Yeah? Okay. So if you have a question or a comment, type it in the comment section below if you're on YouTube, uh, on the live stream, if you're on X, uh, somewhere below this video. I think that's where it's at. Uh, I'll bring up this comment here, which is uh, quite interesting from uh, Lab Experiment on X. It makes more sense to me that users should decide what advertising show up in their feed. I never see, I never need to see an ad for Disney as I don't have kids and have no interest in going there. Your thoughts on this idea, <laughs> Zaddy and Hans. Uh, yeah, I uh, I agree. I mean, I think, I think it should be up to the individual to figure out what ads they want to see. And I, and I believe this is this is available on most, if not all social media platforms, I believe. I think you can click and be like, I don't want to see ads like this. And you can do that. What are your thoughts there, Hans? Yeah, I think it is typically a system that typically operates. Did I say typically enough times? Uh, this is a Share system that normally operates typically nice. by veto. Um, that, you know, if you see something and you don't like it, you can click on it and say, Hey, I don't want to see an ad like this, or I don't want to see ads from whatever this company is. I think that that's probably like, it's the same idea. You know, do you have a radio button checked or unchecked by default when someone fills out a form? And right now, you know, all ads are definitely going to be unchecked by default to override them. Um, and users should have the ability to say, Hey, I don't want to see anything more like this. But also, I think the overall idea that users should really be much more in control of their ad experience is a a very positive idea. This is something that I've thought about for a long time. I think that if there was a platform that allowed advertisers to basically buy attention from individuals directly instead of controlling, like AdSense is obviously the gorilla um, you know, the King Kong of advertising right now. And they are the ones that are making a lot of the decisions. They're kind of like a third party intermediary between advertisers and individuals. And then I think that in the future, platforms will have an opportunity to disrupt that model if they allow those advertisers to have a much more direct relationship um, where you could allow someone to pay you basically to watch their ads and then create a a targeting system that's based around that idea. And I think that, you know, it's possible we'll see something that's much more structured in that way 
in the artificial intelligence based future. Um, you know, depending on what overall um, user interfaces and you, yeah, overall technologies that we see becoming dominant. Yeah. Here's a here's a, a comment from the honest broker. Honest broker is somebody who often goes against the grain in the comment section, and I appreciate that. FYI, thank you. And he gets a lot of flack, <laughs> but we'll, we'll give him a shout out anyway. Uh, thank you, honest. Musk is an R and D and manufacturing business genius. However, he's incredibly stupid in the social media business. I think that what's interesting here, I, I'll give you sort of my opinion, and then Hans, I love to hear yours too. I think I think one could have said the same exact thing as it applied to Musk making the EV back in 2012 and Musk making reusable rockets back in 2007, 2008. I think what's what might be being perceived as stupid is that he's not he's not doing what traditional media companies do today, which is make the advertiser the customer. Like media companies, th their goal here is is to make advertiser the advertiser companies the customer because that's actually what pays the bills, and then they serve it to the <laughs> the user, which is us, right? And so in this sense, where maybe this is what you're what you're referring to, honest is uh, he's incredibly stupid in the social media business. What you may mean is like, well, he's doing all these things that are breaking that revenue source. Like he's literally pissing off advertisers left and right, left and right, which are the lifeblood of the company. I believe he's thinking about it a different way. I believe the way he's thinking about it is he's looking 10 years into the future and he's saying, okay, this platform long term, this quote unquote everything app is not going to be reliant on advertisers for revenue. It's going to be reliant on users, the customer, the user for revenue through financial services, a marketplace, subscriptions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And over the long term, we want advertising to be much a much less percentage of the total revenue stream than it is today. And so when he's thinking about that, based on how he's acting today, he's because he, I've seen this happen many times. He's not going to say, well, I'm going to just act in the way I should be acting now to not piss these people off. I'm just going to build towards this thing and I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And I think that lines up directly with with that with that process. So it might look stupid in the sense of it, it's not what everyone else is doing today, which is quote unquote harming the business. But I think the reality is the the thought process is there's a fundamental disruption to what a media company is right now. And that's what he's trying to build with X. I could be wrong, but that's how I perceive it. What do you think, Hans? Yeah, I think I mean on the dimension of I don't I really don't believe that he's trying to build the most uh, successful social media company. And I think if you evaluated it on that metric, I think that you could say that, you know, in a lot of ways that it's not a very smart business plan. I think what he's trying to do is create an overall self-sustaining business that is a positive force for democracy. And that's a completely different thing than creating the most successful social media business. And, you know, Elon thinks a lot about culture and society and, you know, without society, without humanity, this is something that he's talked about a lot, then basically everything goes away. And right now we live in a very, very complex society that really surpasses anything that has ever existed on earth before. And we don't know if we go through one of those contraction phases like societies have gone through all throughout history and we lose the structures that kind of uphold the global world order today um we don't know how far we can fall and so this is something that he thinks about a lot he's very concerned about and one of the reasons that he's doing all of this is to try and address the cultural elements that sustain versus degrade a society over time. And then as long as he can figure out a business model, and this is something that, this is really the way that he has operated in all his businesses. He wanted to solve our transition to sustainable energy. That was the challenge that he was pursuing. And Tesla was him backing into, not starting with a business model and saying, okay, what are the problems that I can now go out and solve with this business model that I have that I think is gonna work very well. He's like, what's one of the biggest problems in the world that I can solve? And how do I figure out how to build a business model 
in the air around that problem as I solve it. Um, the same thing was true for SpaceX. The same thing was true, honestly, for X.com uh, early on before it became PayPal. And this is just the way that he operates. And so it's not going to look like, you know, trying to build a traditional company and it doesn't operate under the traditional company playbook. And so, yes, if you evaluate it like it is one of those things, it's going to look really dumb for a really long time, just like Tesla looked really dumb for a really long time. SpaceX looked really dumb for a really long time. But then if he is overall successful in achieving the goal of creating a more healthy functioning society for democracy, then and, and the business model is able to sustain itself. That's such a big problem that I think it will be really hard for him to solve that problem without making a lot of money, you know, over the course of decades, maybe not short term, but definitely over the long term. Yeah. And this is where the sort of this follow up uh, comment from uh, Honest Broker comes in. Yes, Farza, you're correct that he wants to shift the business model, but his new business model ideas are unproven and it's unclear whether he's willing to fund those losses required to change. Yeah. So I think I think Hans sort of uh, addressed a lot of that. And it's yeah, it's it's unproven. 100 percent correct. Unclear. 100 percent correct. But if we look at the at the past successes he's had, you know, let's not, you know, past successes don't mean that it's going to continue. I get it. But I think that there is there's something to gather there that if if the fundamental change is better for society, then you can figure out how to make it work over time. And you just know that people will flock to that new alternative and the monetization will follow. Like people are just whether a success if you're somebody who's good enough about cost control and being innovative, that you'll have profits, right? And I think that's where maybe we're we're differing on opinion is that you're maybe you're coming from the standpoint of, well, it's it's not going to work, but I think there's already clues in here that says it is going to work. And sort of the ones that I think about is every time there's been an advertiser boycott, they've come back, and every time the normal it becomes more and more normal to have a CEO say controversial stuff. And I don't see how that's a bad thing. I, if anything, that's a good thing because again, we're we're shifting that Overton window of what can be talked about. And then as advertisers understand that, they'll flock to the place where that it has been artificially suppressed, uh, where, where it's no longer artificially suppressed because now there's a ton of attention on this thing that everyone's like, "Wow, I've never seen this happen before." And then before you know it, the ad people are like, "Whoa, this is crazy!" <laughs> I didn't know I could advertise on this. I think, and and then of course, financial services, subscriptions, marketplace, so on and so forth. That becomes more and more uh, plentiful. That that was a great question, great comment. I'm glad we did that. Uh, that one. Here's a here's a question, not a question from Per Johan. Thank you, Per Johan from from YouTube for your support. Elon is controversial because he thinks he it, it is needed, not because he likes to be controversial. Um, and I think that sort of falls in line with some of the things we we're talking about. Did you want to add anything there? Yeah. Just 100% uh, agreement. From Matt, uh, oh my God, Senko, Senko, sorry, Matt, uh, uh, supporter on YouTube. Thank you so much. Uh, when are we going to see micropayments on X paying for articles instead of having to subscribe to the media source, tipping for high quality content? I'm sure. I'm sure that's coming down the pike. I, I know it's something that uh, Elon mentioned as a feature for X at some point, uh, but I, I'm sure that's going to come. Did you want to add anything to that, Hans? Yeah, there's a system architecture that's in the work. We basically need uh, FSD v12 end to end <laughs> rework for X, and uh, it, it's going to take us we a while sure to do. get there. Um, but when we do, that will definitely be one of the things that is included. Yeah, I agree with that a hundred percent. Let's see if I can come up a uh, a question or two more. Is there one you're seeing there, Hans, that we should bring up? I see a couple of comments of very few comments or not very few, but I'm seeing quite a few comments here, but yep. it's kind of we forgot to ask people to put question at the beginning of their question oh. in all caps to help us. Uh, it's Hans's fault. <laughs> it is my fault. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. I messed up. Uh, I messed up bad. You're. I have to tell you that story if I haven't yet. We'll do that off air though. Okay. It's not appropriate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, maybe we'll do... Maybe we'll do this one uh, from Jim. Musk definitely doesn't have much of a filter. It's refreshing to me and makes many people mad. Um, I, I think I think it is to me. It's it's cool to see somebody of his 
sort of power, influence, and stature, willing to speak his mind, even though I, I, I may not agree with it. It's different. It's cool. It's disruptive. And I, I, I like different and cool and disruptive. <laughs> and some people will be like, you're such a crazy person. Like, maybe. Yeah. There's our, there's our question. <laughs> nice. Yes. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe we'll leave it off there for the first one, Hans. What do you think? Um, yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to hit good. before we? Yeah. No, I think this might actually be a good place to kind of wrap it up and take it home. Yeah. Let us know in the comments how um, how you like this uh, discussion. Uh, definitely something I'm looking very much looking forward to doing on a weekly basis here with Hans. It'll be a varied discussion uh, for all of us to, to kind of walk through. The goal here is to tackle things that are maybe not spoken about too much in depth and to try and use this platform to for Hans and I selfishly to get our brains empty before we go into the weekend. Um, before we leave, um, <laughs> I love Perth. <laughs> That's two questions that haven't been questions, but I really appreciate it, Per Johan. I would like to thank you, uh, Per Johan, for supporting us. Thank you, thank you, brother. You're you're awesome. Um, I want to show you guys a picture before we leave, uh, if that's okay. We uh, I know some of your folks are uh, have been asking about a producer wife slash producer soon to be mom, uh, my lovely wife Cindy. Here's a picture from uh, we went and saw the uh, baby doctor a couple of days ago and. Here's our little baby boy chilling in the womb. And apparently he looks like me already. My wife's saying he looks like me already. So we'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's our baby boy, May 25th. Incredibly proud. I just wanted to show it because I'm like, I, I'm over the moon. I don't even know. Like it's changed me so much already as a person. It's like, I'm just, I feel so fortunate and lucky. So I uh, love you guys very much. I know you're constantly asking about an update. So there's your update. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, any, any parting words, Hans, from your end? Congratulations. Kids are awesome. It's going to be a great experience. Um, yeah, I can't wait for your life to get wrecked. It's going to be sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep who? Sleep who? <laughs> Dude, we should do like a, a comparison next year. I, I want to see how big yep. the bags under my eyes are going to be. Yeah, we'll do it before and after. All right, everybody. Love you guys very much. Have a fantastic weekend. Love you all very much. If we agree or disagree, I just love that. Uh, that we're creating a place where more of this kind of this discussion can happen. And I, this is all, I think this is all positive. And I thank you very much, Hans, for uh, being somebody that I can have these discussions with. You're awesome. And make sure you go follow Hans at Hans C. Nelson on YouTube uh, or, and, and on X as well. Fantastic channel, super in-depth discussions about technology and artificial intelligence and society. And maybe you'll do one soon about religion, maybe? Yep, Maybe. it'll come out. So we uh, we'll tease. There was a discussion with Zuby this week, and I have to. I had some technical difficulties getting it off the ground, which means that my editing challenge is going to be much harder because I got to go back and fix a bunch of stuff. Um, but yeah, hopefully here in the next couple days, um, definitely early next week, I will have that out and published on YouTube. If people are on X, it's a space and uh, y'all can just go look that up and find it and listen to it. It was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, looking forward to sharing that with the YouTube crowd. Heck yeah. And at some point, I, I would maybe want you and I should do a religion one at some point because I, I I find it very interesting. I find it very yeah. interesting. Yeah, very, very it interesting. Is interesting. All right, everybody. Love you. Love you guys. Love you, Hans. We'll see you next week for our weekly discussion. And then the we'll, I'll keep posting videos as I usually do.